Yo, Elevate, what's up, what's up? Welcome to Palm Sunday. Welcome to Palm Sunday. I just want to say a big welcome home. Welcome back, everyone. Um, if you are a first-time guest with us here today, or maybe it's your second or third time, uh, I just want to say a big welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I pray that you will be encouraged, you will be inspired, but most of all, I pray that you will be challenged to grow in your relationship with the Lord. Um, so I want to get right into today's message. I, I, I pray and I encourage you to fulfill the Great Commission and take an opportunity with things like social media like we have here today uh, and, and that exists that you can share today's message on your Facebook uh, or you can take the link from today when we're all done even and you can then spread it out. So whether you're following on Facebook Live, whether you're following through our YouTube channel or through our website, we just want to say welcome. Welcome back, guys, today. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, please go back to our earlier messages. The context of the entire series really sets the stage for where we're leading to this week into Easter Sunday. The greatest day on the Christian calendar is next week on Resurrection Sunday, what we call Easter Sunday, baby. So today we're going to walk through on Palm Sunday. I've entitled my message, He Entered Triumphantly. He Entered Triumphantly. So now the past four weeks, we have been walking through basically the story of the hours, first of all, the hours that have been leading up to Jesus' resurrection, uh, incidents that were predicted by the prophet Isaiah. He has 24 prophecies. We've covered every single one of them. We've taken the major focus on things on how he allowed himself to be treated like a criminal, how he kept silent the entire time because he was to prepare to be the lamb, like a lamb, that would be led to the slaughter. And we talked about the betrayal that would lead to this and, and the, the circumstances. What are the odds that every single one of these things that have been predicted 700 years earlier could even come into place? Now, one of the most famous predictions that have been made of the Messiah was fulfilled, uh, that was made by the prophet Zechariah, it was about Jesus, and we haven't spoke about this, would be riding into, uh, uh, into Jerusalem on a donkey. That the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, you got to remember, Zechariah now lived about 500 B.C. So this is about 500 years. We had heard originally 700 when we see Isaiah. And now Zechariah talks, you know, he, he comes around 200 years after Isaiah. And this is the time he writes about what we will call Palm Sunday today. Now, let's go to your book. So if you haven't yet, pull out your printed versions. Uh, I have mine on my own screen right now, just to make things easier. Uh, maybe you have a computer or a tablet. You use your digital uh, Bible app, or you, you rely on the good old printed word. A lot of us really still like using the print. Whatever you need, I actually find that the print almost is too small for me without putting my glasses on. So I find it makes it easier to blow it up on my screen. Whatever works. But I want you to work with me in the book of Zechariah as I get ready to start today. Father, I pray, God, that today, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the eyes of our understanding be open. Show us and direct us. Uh, help us in our journey as we draw closer to you and we help you build your kingdom. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this incredible journey. And Lord, I pray for those that today, they're curious, they're, 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 they're wondering, they have questions. Maybe they're, they're newer in their relationship to you and, and they want, I pray God that you would give them revelation of the understanding of your word. And we ask that your word would come alive in each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. Okay, Zechariah 9 verse 9. It says, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph. You ready? Daughter Jerusalem, look for your king is coming to you. He's talking about the Messiah, the coming king, the king of all kings. It says he is righteous and victorious. He's humble. And remember, most kings are not humble. He is humble and riding on a donkey. Now that's, it says a colt the full of a donkey. 
Now, interesting enough, because a donkey was not something a king would ride on, but it was foretold that the Messiah would come and be riding like this. Now, during Zechariah's prophetic days, the nation of Israel, I want you to, to recall back to this and to maybe other series and messages we've done, um, but it was about the rebuilding of their city of Israel and the, the nation because they had returned from exile in Babylon. The walls of Jerusalem were still in ruins. You got to remember, there was no gate for uh, Jesus to ride through at that point in time. Yet Zechariah had boldly predicted that one day the Messiah, the king, that would mean that there's going to have to be gates in place, would ride triumphantly into the city and he would arrive with shouts of joy that would be coming around. What are the odds that that could happen? What are the odds? Yet it did. It did, and it's recorded in history. It's recorded in the scriptures in history. It's recorded in the history books that we can read about this, and they celebrated annually. This is a prediction that is a high probability of never coming to pass. The probability is one in 20,000, one in 20,000 that the Messiah would make a triumphant return to Jerusalem. You're saying, well, that's not too bad. You know, I played some lotteries. Well, that he would ride into Jerusalem, and, and it's not just riding, that he would do it on the donkey. Now, a little higher, like a, a, even a higher chance, was one in 1,000 that Jesus would be betrayed by a friend. So coming in on a donkey was double the, the probability that he would come on a donkey than even being betrayed by a friend, the Messiah. Uh, I mean, incredible numbers. Now, Think about this, 10 prophecies. We can probably t t total up all the probabilities of 10 prophecies coming to place, but we discover that the odds uh, of one man independently and simultaneously fulfilling 10 prophecies, you ready this? 10 prophecies, I'm going to give you the probability. This, this came by a man named Stoner, and by the way, he was not stoned. Uh, he was a mathematician. One in 16,425 one in 16,425 with 47 zeros behind it. That's right. So it's one in 16,425 to the 47th power, I guess is how you would say it. So I want to walk you through today, through things today that are going to happen over this week over this coming next week. And you're going to be able to see now in your mind's eye view. We've done in the hours, the day and the hours leading up to the Resurrection Sunday. We're going to backtrack a little bit here and we're going to go to the final days of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, and, and in fact, the weekend marks, this weekend marks the beginning of what we call Holy Week. Maybe some of you are not as familiar with Holy Week. So less than 20, 30 minutes from now, you're going to know what Jesus did on each day of the week and my hope is that tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up and, and you're going to say, I know what Jesus was doing on this day in history. I know what Jesus was doing. Because when you begin to understand the days and leading up, you begin to identify and it takes on a whole new meaning. It takes on a whole new relationship. We, we, we have this already when, when the day of 9-11 happened. We all can recall where we were or what we did if we were old enough. We know this day in history. And this is the most important day in history in the life of any Christian. And then every morning, you're going to be able to think about the celebration of Easter next weekend. All right. So let's get a running start on this by moving backwards. So we're, for me, I'm shaking. So you're going to move backwards uh, from Easter weekend. Today being Palm Sunday. So... Where, what was Jesus doing leading up to the resurrection? Well, over the last several weeks, he's been journeying south. So he's going south from Caesarea Philippi down to Jerusalem. And he's teaching in the villages all along the way. And he's training the 12. So he's training the 12 in preparation. Jesus knows he's got to be in the holy city for the Passover. He's got to be there. And so he's got to plan his trip. And so he's paced his travels. He's had to pace his travels to train the 12 right up to the last minute. Now, on the day before he makes his way to Jerusalem, he arrives in what is called an oasis city, and it's the oasis city of Jericho, which is about 14 miles. So it's about 
14, about 14 miles east of Jerusalem, and it's approximately 4,000 feet below Jerusalem. So it's elevated above. So Jerusalem is elevated above Jericho. So what happened during the Holy Week? So this next coming Friday is going to be called Good Friday. So why don't we backtrack to a couple days ago to the Friday before Good Friday. And that's where we're going to start. So we're going to go to the Friday before Good Friday and leading us up to everything. So now it's the Friday before the Good Friday where Jericho, in Jericho, sorry, where Zacchaeus becomes a Jesus follower. Let us read in the book of Luke in the 19th chapter. He entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a name, man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able to see because of the crowd since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. Watch this. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. Jesus welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it, they began to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today, salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. The son of man has come. Why has he come? to seek and save the lost. So salvation was on Jesus's mind. It's because salvation is why he came. And for us, the reason he came was for us, was for our salvation, to be entered into his family, that forever family. So following lunch now, let's get back to our story. Following lunch uh, with Zacchaeus, Jesus and his disciples now have to hike a grueling, ascent from Jericho and start to move up in that elevation to a small village that's going to be now only about two miles east of Jerusalem. It's a place called Bethany. Walk with me. So Bethany is the home of some good friends of Jesus. There's some siblings and they're named Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So remember where we are. So we're on the Friday before Good Friday. Jesus and his disciples, they make this 12 mile hike up to Bethany now, before sundown on Friday, because the Sabbath, by the way, begins at sundown, and no one is to walk more than two-thirds of a mile on the Sabbath. Now, in the Jewish calendar, the Sabbath is on the, what we call our Saturday. So they hoof it 12 miles. They go up 12 miles uphill. They cover 4,000 feet in vertical elevation in one afternoon, and they arrive uh, at Lazarus' house, and they are very tired. Now, I want to move over to the scripture in John now, in John 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So this is Jesus' friend, Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. Now, six days before Good Friday is the Sabbath. So Jesus and his disciples likely have attended a local synagogue that morning. They've rested and they've had to recover from their previous day's journey, which was on the Friday. So Holy Week has continued now. We are at number two, Saturday before Palm Sunday. We are now on Saturday before Palm Sunday. So it's in Bethany though, that Mary anointed Jesus. So Mary anoints Jesus. Let's look in the book of John in the 12th chapter and score to verse two. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. Uh, so the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Growing up, you know, I read that, and, and the, the meaning it didn't have the same meaning as it has to me today. See, 
something is important. During that era, by the way, scholars estimate that 50% of Jewish women were all named Mary at that point. It was after Moses' sister, Miriam. Uh, so we're not completely sure who, by all scholars, and, and there's, there's not a consensus on this, of who this Mary was that is referred to as Mary of Bethany is what she's known as. Uh, some call her Mary, the sister of Lazarus, or Mary of Bethany. Well, the majority actually do believe that this was Mary Magdalene, who had been forgiven by Jesus previously when she was caught in the act of adultery. Now, regardless, it doesn't really matter if you think that this is Mary Magdalene or that Mary of Bethany is separate from Mary Magdalene. It doesn't change the storyline of where we're going. But whoever she is, she is one grateful Mary. Her gratitude for what Jesus has done for her moves her to take her absolutely most precious possession, which is an alabaster jar of oils. That she, so she grabs these oils that, uh, uh, that she grabs that they're imported probably from India. And then she takes them and she pours them onto Jesus' feet. Now, it was a sign of hospitality when someone enters your home as a host to wash the guest's feet. Yes, if you were a guest, as a sign of hospitality, they wash your feet. But if you're rich, also a servant would do it, right? It was a way to serve them. Now, the fact that Mary went an extra mile above and beyond and anointed Jesus' feet. Now, I want you to remember, she anointed, it says. Now, the word anoint is about a call. The anointed one is the called out one. She anointed Jesus' feet with costly perfume. And then she wipes them with her hair, and it shows how much she loved him and how much she respected him, and it signified he was a called-out one. Jesus was a called-out. Now, Jesus doesn't say, no, 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 I'm not worthy. Jesus doesn't say that. He pretty much is saying, I am worthy. He's making a statement here, and he receives it in the spirit in which it was given. And sometimes... I'm going to say this, that a costly gift is the right gift for Jesus. Now, the funny thing about generosity is you notice how sometimes a person's generosity actually attracts criticism. Let me show you this. Go back to the book of John in the 12th. We're going to go to verse 4 and work our way through 4 to 6. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii? And given to the poor. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor. See, Judas, by the way, he has his own agenda, right? Some people don't like it when others give generously. And it's because it nudges an impulse within them. It nudges that impulse within them to give more generously themselves. And, and, and others don't like it when you give generously because they don't like the admiration that maybe the giver gets. It brings jealousy. And Judas didn't like it. And listen, so it says, because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, he was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. How would he know that he would still be buried? Remember we talked about the last minutes leading up to, it was not certain that he would be buried. It was not certain any of these things would come to place. If he was a man that was trying to pretend to, to fulfill the, the moments that were foretold, he was not a criminal. Um, and, and so why therefore would he actually be crucified? He knew this and he knew he would be buried. He knew this would come to pass, uh, could come to pass because it was foretold and it was the plan of God. What are the odds? It's against all the odds. It says, for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now, I want you to remember the sun ends. Sorry, the Sabbath ends and now at sundown. And now we move to today. Holy Week moves to Palm Sunday. That's today. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the donkey. Let's now look in John 12, verses starting in verse 9 through 11. Then the large crowd of the Jews learned he was there. Now remember, Bethany's just two miles. He's coming from Bethany, two miles from Jerusalem. They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, the one he had raised from the dead. 
But the chief priests had decided to kill Lazarus also because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them, believing in Jesus because Jesus having raised him from the dead. So Jesus mingles with the crowd, remember, on Saturday night. And the next day, when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. And they kept shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. All right, so this is what we see. So palm branches, you got to know, are a sign of victory. The palm branches are a sign of victory happening. They're expecting him to become the victorious king. After all, anyone can raise someone from the dead, can surely defeat the Romans. And that's what they wanted. They wanted to have the Romans defeated. The Messiah was coming to save them. So they're laying down these palm branches and they're shouting Hosanna. Uh, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel, right? They were, they've been waiting for a king for so long. Now let's go to verse 14 in chapter 12 and read through 19. Jesus found a young donkey and he sat on it. Just as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. He's referring to what would happen that was already been prophesied. So in order to communicate to them, you got to remember, he had no political, he had no military plans. Uh, Jesus rides in on a lonely donkey instead of a mighty steed, instead of a mighty horse. It says his disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Meanwhile, the crowd, which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. These are the villagers, by the way, from Bethany. This is also why the crowd met him, because they've heard he had done this sign. Then the Pharisees said to one another, you see, You've accomplished nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. In other words, we've done nothing. So you got to notice the tension between them now. A crowd of supporters and a crowd of opponents that are in place. John did a good job of really discovering, uh, describing the highs while forecasting the low that was actually coming. So I want to move over to the book of Luke a little bit as we move around in 19 verse 41 to 46. Now it refers to, and he says, as he approached and saw the city, he wept for it. He wept for it. When is the last time you have wept for others? When is the last time you have wept for the people? People without God, people without understanding, people. And, and, and if you wept for them, why would you not do something for them? Why would you not share into their life? Why would you, why, how is it that we can go about and not feel a weeping and a crying for those who are not in God's church, those who are not followers of him. I digress. And he said, saying, if you knew this day what peace would bring, for now it is hidden from your eyes, and that is our world around us without him. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you and hem you in on every side. This is the, what he's pro, this is being prophesied. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst, because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. Then after his donkey ride now, he went into the temple, and he began to throw out those who were selling. And he said, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, for you have made it a den of thieves. Now I want you to see the context of what happens. I think sometimes we get all wrapped up in what Jesus, what his plan was and how we were to treat the temple. But you got to understand what's happening. He's coming to be, to, to f do, fulfill what the Messiah was to be, and that is the forever king. And he's preparing and he's seeing these people that are misusing the temple. They're focused on the wrong things. They're focused in on their religion. They're focused in on their self instead of being focused in on him. And so on Palm Sunday, the first day of the most important week in the life of the most important person who ever lived, we find that Jesus received praise and prayers as he rode into Jerusalem. We also see that he wept over the future destruction of the people and its city. We see that he went into the temple to worship but he wound up cleansing it of the money changers who are just taking advantage of people rather than helping them connect with God. 
So what happened the rest of Holy Week? Well, we're going to go to number four, which is Monday through Wednesday. So let's talk about that. This is when he taught the crowds in the temple and the disciples in Bethany. So this is Monday through Wednesday. He is teaching the crowds in the temple and he's teaching his disciples back in Bethany. So how do we know this? Let's take a look over in Luke 19 and verse 47 and 48. Every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people were looking for a way to kill him. But they could not find a way to do it because all the people were captivated at what they had heard. So he's been teaching the crowds. And so what we see is he's sleeping overnight in Bethany. So he's walking the two miles into town in the mornings each day. And during that time, Jesus is teaching in the temple. He's healing the sick. He, he's, uh, he spars with religious leaders each day. Uh, they, they want so badly to discredit Jesus that, that they pose all sorts of th uh, theoretical and theological questions to Jesus. And he just fields all those questions with poise. And at night, Jesus goes back and trains his disciples back in Bethany, two miles away, because he's getting them ready for what he knows is coming. But they haven't been able to grasp or face yet. And this is the front half of the week. So that moves us to Thursday, which we call Monday Thursday. <laughs> Monday Thursday. <laughs> so on Monday Thursday, which really means Commandment Thursday, because Jesus issues them a new commandment. So this is on Monday Thursday. It, this is where Jesus lays low in Bethany. He celebrates now the Last Supper. And he issues the new commandment. He prays in the garden and he's arrested by the temple guard. So Jesus changes his pattern. He's no longer doing what he had done previously. His confrontations with the Pharisees has now escalated every day at the temple. He knows they're looking to seize him now. And he's got one more thing to do before he can let this, it happen. Before they can seize him. So he lays low and he rests. In Bethany. So he's resting in Bethany on Thursday, on Monday, Thursday. And in Luke 22 and verse 1, the festival of the unleavened bread, which is called Passover, was approaching. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put him to death, that's Jesus, because they were afraid of the people. See, he's made arrangements for the Seder meal, but he doesn't, he doesn't even tell his disciples the location of that Last Supper. They don't even know so that Judas can't betray him because it's not time for Judas to betray him until this is done. So he just sends two of them, Peter and John, he sends out to make the preparations. So let's continue back in the scripture and go into the book of Luke, 22nd chapter and in verse seven. It says, then the day of the unleavened bread came when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. Listen, he said to them, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters. Tell the owner of the house. The teacher asks you, where is the guest room that I can eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished room upstairs. Make the preparations there. So it's very cloak and dagger now at this moment. Jesus doesn't want anyone to know where he is uh, and so that he can initiate uh, the communion and teach and pray over his disciples one at a time. It says, so they went and they found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Again, he knows what is going to happen. Even though he's not a criminal, he could have worked his way out of this. What were the odds that he would be crucified as a criminal when he committed no crime? Now you have to love Jesus here. You have to love what he does. He's about to face the worst night of, of, that he's ever faced in his entire life. He is fully engaged and expressing the love to his disciples. What a meal must have this been. <laughs> An incredible meal. And I hope this week that you will take time 
and look through these passages and walk through Jesus and everything that happens in this holiest week in history. In fact, I, I encourage you to, to even for those of you, maybe you love watching a great movie, you know, uh, depending on, on what you can handle or not, you know, the passion of Christ, the passion of the Christ. I mean, to, to watch some of the movies uh, that have been put out there, that might even help you to take time in the story or find some things on a YouTube or Vimeo or, but over the last four weeks we've covered what happens from this place forward uh, is, is going to be the preparation of what we taught in the last four weeks previous. So let me just summarize it kind of for you here as we move to Good Friday, number six. This is Good Friday Day. Good Friday was really uh, our best day. Good Friday's our best day, but it's God's worst day. Jesus endures six trials. We talked about that. He was mocked. We talked about that. He was beaten. We talked about it. He was crucified while the sin of the world was laid upon him. We talked about that. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. We talked about that. And he takes the thief on the cross to paradise before anyone. And we talked about that. What are the odds? What are the odds? The odds are improbable that they could ever happen. And they were recorded in history 700 plus years, just the 24 that we talk about specifically by the prophet Isaiah. We've gone into five, uh, 500 years previous. We, we see Zechariah. He's talking about the triumphant return. There is over 300 plus, some believe 320 prophecies that were all fulfilled by Jesus as the coming Messiah. The probability is so incredible to ever happen. I mean, it's against all odds. Jesus endured the six trials between 2 and 8 a.m. And, I, I, you know, three at the hands of the Roman government, three at the hands of the Jewish government between these hours, all six trials, they're trumped up charges. They're not even real charges. Many of them were held illegally. None of them had substantiating witnesses at all, which is, by the way, a requirement of Jewish law to have witnesses. And Jesus is beaten by Roman soldiers 39 times with a multiple lash whip. He's mocked. He had crowns of thorn put on his head. He was crucified uh, on Golgotha between two thieves. He was buried in that rich man's tomb. The day before, we know as Easter Sunday, we move into Holy Saturday. This is number seven. Holy Saturday. Jesus descends to Hades and led captives free to heaven. So let's walk through this part. Jesus spends Saturday, which is called Holy Saturday, and he spends it in the grave. The book of Ephesians explains this. So if you're following with me, let's look into Ephesians as we get ready to wrap up. Ephesians 4 and verse 7, verse to 10. Now grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things fulfill the prophecies. Jesus descends into Hades and sets the captives free, taking to heaven all those who were waiting for him of what is called Abraham's side. Totally different book study we'd have to go into. But couldn't get into heaven. They could not yet because their passage was based on Christ's substitutionary sin payment for them on the cross. So they could not enter into heaven until that had been fulfilled. Now, I don't want to spoil the story for you because we're going to cover it next week. But the next day comes Resurrection Sunday. The next day is Resurrection Sunday. This is where Jesus rose from the dead. This is where he greeted Mary Magdalene. It's where he, after he rose, it's where he walked seven miles with friends. It's where he went through a wall. It's where he ate some fish. It was a week like no other. 
I want you to understand this, this series against all odds. It is against all odds. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what was said and what has happened. And the probability of it coming to pass has never, there is no probability that's ever come into past of anything that has been prophesied, like the 300 plus prophecies, let alone just a single 10 to come to place of what we have read. It happened in history. You need to know it was predicted 700 plus years earlier, leading to hundreds of years earlier. It was predicted by prophets. It was seen by what eyewitnesses at the day of the time. It was recorded in posterity. We are recipients of his blessings. We are recipients of its blessings. Uh, he, God is someone. Jesus is someone you can trust. Let him have your life today. Let him have your life forever. Father, I pray. I pray God today that those within the sound of my voice, God, that, that even in now you feel a tugging in your spirit. You feel like you, you know God's been calling you for so long. Today is a day. Today is a day. Today is a day. Jesus forgives you. He died in place of what you did wrong. He did nothing. But because of his love, he gave his life so you could have life with him so you could be a part of a forever family and so today would you accept him would you accept him into your life would you say jesus forgive me forgive me for my sin my wrongdoing thank you for taking my place that i could now join your family thank you for doing it and today i choose to follow you I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to repent, turn and do a 180 and change the direction of my life. And I vow to follow you and be a follower of you. And I thank you. And maybe today, as a believer, as a Christian, as we've been sharing, my question is, is what does Easter mean to you? For years as a Christian, Easter was a wonderful time. It was a time of a resurrection. It was a time of his death, a little bit of time of mourning. But when you begin to fathom what he actually did, it takes a whole different light. There should be an impassion within you that this is something special. This whole week leading up, it means something. And it should mean something to you as a believer and a follower of Jesus. If you follow Jesus, you follow his way. If you are a Christian, this is the week that he prepared us for so that we could be forgiven, so that he could build his church. And church, I'm asking you to walk with me this week. Send out and prepare. Invite others even to our live stream for next week. Invite them, share with them the prophecies and the improbabilities. Share with them the odds. Share with them that God did all this so that you can be blessed with him so that you could be in a place, that you could be in a place and a forever family with him. Not a place where you're cursed, but a place where you're blessed. Could you not share that for all that he has done for you? Could you just reach out, have conversations, make this week something more? And I challenge you, make this week something more than just another week. And next week, and we take one day a week, make your Christianity, make your life mean something more. You are a Christian, and when you are a part of God's church, church is 24-7. The body of Christ is 24-7. It should be every moment, every day, every hour. Father, I pray for strength this week as people share. I pray, God, that as we lead into this week, God, that people from all over, God, to our message and the message that comes across from other Christians worldwide, God, I pray that your kingdom would be filled with believers. God, that people would turn and place their trust and believe in you. And God, I pray that we would do our part in sharing that wonderful news. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, God bless you. Please take, share. If you, if you are on Facebook, I encourage you to share our event. As, so tomorrow on Monday, 
uh, as we prepare to lead into the, so we got uh, we got our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? This is the time of Holy Week, Holy Monday. On Holy Monday, we're sending out our link for next week's live stream. We're going to make it into an event as well so people can sign up. Could you make sure, sign in that you're coming and then share it with others. Invite friends personally. Um, if you're more of a YouTube follower, you don't follow on Facebook, could you email it out to others? Could you use other social media streams? Take advantage of everything. So as we lead into the greatest day on the Christian calendar of Easter Sunday and this week, spend more time than you spent even this year. We may be in a pandemic, but regardless of a pandemic, see, the thing is, is whatever comes down, God's intent is never to destroy something without building something greater. And I believe God's church is building into something greater than it previously was before this pandemic. Let's take advantage. Let's do our job. Let's join forces with what Jesus has led us into, and that is into his kingdom. Amen. God bless. You guys have a beautiful and wonderful week. We look forward to seeing you next week on Easter Sunday. God bless.